Uh, good evening, everyone. For any of our guests who don't know who I am, I'm Isla Berman. I'm Dean of the UVA School of Architecture. And I have the pleasure this evening of introducing our event and our panelists. Uh, the event is entitled Counterparts. That will be a presentation by Sumaya Valley of Counter Space and founder of Counterparts and Leslie Loku, who is our UVA Jacqueline Robertson visiting professor this year. This will be followed by a conversation with myself and Nancy Levinson, who's the editor and executive director of Places Journal. I'll briefly uh, introduce our guest presenters and panelists. So Leslie Loco is a Ghanaian Scottish architect, educator, scholar, and novelist. She's founder and director of the African Futures Institute in Accra, Ghana. And I believe in the process of developing a school, an academic architectural program there, uh, and was recently Dean of the Bernard and Ann Spitzer School of Architecture at the City College in New York. Her work, which focuses on critical questions of race, identity politics, and social justice, in particular, the relationship of race and identity to the built environment, has taken on many forms from traditional forms of scholarship, teaching, design practice, and academic leadership, to other forms of practice within and outside of the academy, uh, such as documentaries, exhibitions, and fiction writing, which offer other avenues to articulate questions and ideas around race, belonging, and identity. She's the editor of White Papers, Black Marks, Race, Space, and Architecture, an anthology dedicated to studying race within the architectural canon, and Folio Journal of Contemporary African Architecture, Africa's first internationally peer-reviewed journal of contemporary African architecture. She has taught across three continents uh, in the UK, Africa, and the US, and was the founder and director of the Graduate School of Architecture at the University of Johannesburg from 2014 to 19, a time of student-led prote political protests, which paved the way for new initiatives in architectural education and pedagogy. She was recently awarded the 2020 RIBA Annie Spink Award for Excellence in Architectural Education, and the 2021 Ada Louise Huxtable Award for Contribution to Architecture. Uh, she holds degrees from architecture degrees from the Bartlett School of Architecture, as well as a PhD from the University of London. Sumaya Valley is the founder and principal of Counterspace and recently founded Counterparts, a platform for experimental collaboration. Her interdisciplinary design research and pedagogical practice is committed to searching for expression for hybrid identities and contested territories. She has written that there is always architecture waiting to happen in places that are overlooked, operating with the intent to reveal the invisible. And she uses Johannesburg as a laboratory to do this through speculative histories, future archeologies span and new design languages that also draw upon other media such as performance for inspiration. And I think you'll see some of this uh, in tonight's presentation. She's currently based between Johannesburg and London and was the architect with Counterspace selected for the prestigious Serpentine Pavilion uh, architectural installation in 2020-21, being the youngest architect to receive this honor and commission. She was also honored on Time's Next 100 list of leaders shaping innovation globally. So Maya is also an educator at the Graduate School of Architecture at the University of Johannesburg, the unit leader of an African almanac, and is currently a visiting critic with us teaching with Leslie Loco this semester at UVA. Nancy Levinson uh, is the editor and executive director of Places Journal, one of the most critical interdisciplinary journals of architecture, landscape architecture, and urbanism. She's responsible for the transformation of places from a print journal into a highly successful online platform, uh, which celebrated its uh, 10th anniversary last year and has been advancing the editorial mission of public scholarship to bring a much wider audience and group of readers to our disciplines, which I would say is uh, very necessary and overdue, uh, while also overseeing the launch of Places Books. Uh, previous to Places, Nancy was the founding director of the Phoenix Urban Research Lab at ASU in Arizona and a founding editor of Harvard Design Magazine uh, at the Harvard GSD. She, she writes uh, daily uh, for many design journals uh, beyond her own uh, and is also on a mission to teach academics how to write uh, and how to write to reach a broader public. 
Uh, she holds a BA from Yale and a Master of Architecture from Penn. And I should probably also note uh, that UVA is a school supporter of places uh, as part of the partnership and participates on its board. And we're thrilled uh, to be partnering with places uh, on this event this evening. Tonight, uh, tonight will be both a provocation and a conversation that I hope will be inspiring as well as critical and affirmative. And with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Leslie and Samaya and say welcome and thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna share my screen, hold on a second. Great. So um, good evening. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure for both of us to be here. And thank you, Isla, for that very kind introduction. It's also an enormous pleasure for me to be on a virtual stage with Samaya. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time we've lectured together outside South Africa. So this is doubly special. The title of our talk is Counterparts, which is a play on the name of Samaya's practice, Counterspace, on the one hand, and a description of our working relationship over the past six years. It is an absolute honor to call Leslie a counterpart, a partner, mentor, and friend like no other. Counterparts is also the name of an arm of Counterspace that was formed during COVID, a response to developing experimental methods of collaboration across real and virtual spaces, much like this one, through publishing and practice. We split the talk into four sections, talking, teaching, testing, and telling. Although in truth, and as we've described it here, we are always in between, neither one thing nor another, not fish, not fowl, not fixed, but not untethered either, which is an important distinction. We feel ourselves to be tethered quite firmly to specific places and specific times, particularly historical time. We're also interested in the subtle similarities and the differences between being in-betweeners and being hybrids, which share characteristics, but also differ. There are a couple of points we'd like to make about tonight's talk. One is that it lies somewhere between a performance and a presentation. It requires a little work on your part to tie the various threads together, but as we hope you will find by the end of it, your work is as much a part of it as ours. You too are the authors of this text. The other is that although we talk about ourselves, both our personal and our professional selves, this is not a talk about us. In 2020, 26 million people in the world do not live in the country in which they were born. Although this is a relatively small percentage of the world's population, about three and a half percent, numbers are rising each year by roughly 3%. The US continues to lead the world. One in five people in the US is an immigrant. The issues we talk about therefore, both here in this lecture and more broadly through our work, race, identity, difference, diaspora, should at least in theory find resonance in this specific moment in history? Um, I think that the capacity to decide who can move and who can settle where and under what conditions might become the core of uh, ongoing political struggles over sovereignty and nationalism uh, citizenship and identity, or for that matter, security and freedom. What strikes me most about having Leslie as a counterpart is her very existence. Here we are, two women, hybrid identities, spanning geographies, half a generation apart. Representation has always been a central theme for us. With our students, we often talk about being able to imagine differently in architecture through different forms of drawing and representation. Our own twinning has been central to my own expansions of the definition of an architect. Roland Barth, speaking of Balzac's novella, Saracen, begins, it was woman with her sudden fears, her irrational whims, 
her instinctive fears, her unprovoked bravado, her daring, and her delicious delicacy of feeling. Barthes asked the question, who is speaking in this way? Is it the, the story's hero? Is it the author Balzac? Is it universal wisdom about women? Is it romantic psychology or literary femininity? It is impossible to know for the good reason that all writing is itself this special voice consisting of several indiscernible voices and that literature is precisely the invention of this voice to which we cannot assign a specific origin. Literature is that neutral, composite, oblique into which every subject escapes, the trap where all identity is lost, beginning with the very body that writes. Mirror, noun, a reflecting glass, a looking glass, an observation, a model, an example. To look at, observe, watch, or contemplate, from mirare, the Latin of mirari, to wonder at or admire. Of course, the worth of working with Leslie and having her example at the helm cannot be overstated. But more than a model alone, I think a true counterpart also shines light on things in the other person that they themselves were not aware of. The cliche, she brings out the best in me, comes to mind. Speaking of the counterpart and of positions of difference as forms and lenses of potential, we think through shadows, twins, doppelgangers. Each interaction brings about different reflections, views and perspectives that our own conversations and work together often sharpens. These have also become useful positions for pedagogy and practice. We live and work in, and indeed we both embody hybrid contexts that have underbellies, ghosts, fragments, and mirrors of other contexts. Project, Folded Skies by Counterspace. Sometimes the work of the architect is to turn a mirror to our context to sharpen and show us aspects of our worlds that have been conditioned, that we have been conditioned to be blind to. For human consumption, there must be a dissection, a label, a putting back together, calling it a thing, turning the stone over in our hands, color, shape, size, weight, name. What label is required before we will know that we are what we breathe? The shape, color, and materiality of this work became through Joburg Sunset. When it is clear, Joburg's sky moves gracefully and soundlessly through the shades of colors you have never known. As the sun drops behind the horizon at the end of the day, it looks idyllic. You want to touch it, hold it, never let it go. Breathe in all of the magnificence. The amount of pollution, dust, and chemical particles in Joburg's air produced by its legacy of mining is said to create these brilliant sunsets. This installation, was envisioned for Johannesburg mine dumps and installed at Speer Wein Estate in Stellenbosch. It collects in a drop the atmospheric and the intangible. Its feminine silence fails, but also mirrors an unseen context, the unspoken consequences of beauty, so often created by decentralized labor and by resource extraction. Project. Radio Maxin by Rowan Woodley, Unit 12. In 2019, Unit 12, the studio that Leslie and I co-taught for three years, visited Morocco. These stills of investigatory work into the structure of the Creole language in Morocco, Darija, by one of our students, Rowan Moodley, an English, Afrikaans, and Zulu-speaking student. Rowan is interested in the structure of language as a tool to design with. The lexicon of a Creole language it is largely supplied by the parent language, but they are often major phonetic and semantic shifts. Rowan studies the ways in which the Creole draws on and adopts some of the form of the parent language, but speaks back to it by altering its deep structure and its semantics. Turning a mirror onto something can also show us its subtleties, its silences, and its secrets. What is hidden beneath our inherited languages of seeing, and how do we unlock these? Some months ago, just when I was preparing to leave the US, Samaya sent me a link to one of the most affirming and insightful texts I've ever read, the late Svetlana Boym's Sinography of a Friendship, 
ostensibly about the friendship between Hannah Arendt and Mary McCarthy, but equally about anyone who maintains a friendship in spite of, or perhaps more accurately, because of distance. Writing about men and women in dark times, Arendt observed that in the circumstances of extremity, the illuminations do not come from philosophical concepts, but from the uncertain, flickering, and often weak light that men and women kindle and shed over the lifespan given to them. This luminous space where they come out of their origins and reflect each other's sparks is the space of humaneness and friendship that sheds light on the world of appearances we inhabit. In other words, friendship is not about having everything illuminated or obscured, but about conspiring and playing with shadows. Its goal is not enlightenment or luminosity, not a quest for the blinding truth, but only for occasional lucidity and honesty. In so many ways, this text also describes the nature of our teaching partnership, both in the way that we look for those same moments of lucidity in the work of our students, but also in the way we speak to each other across tutorial table and often across the heads of our students. The tutorial is a way of testing our own responses to the work, which is on the one hand, of course, the work the students produce, but their work is also our work, although not in the sense of authorship, but in the sense of collaboration. From the outset, we've been interested in the idea of students as guests from the future, inspired by the South African writer Nadine Gordimer's description of artists in the widest possible sense of the word, as prophets of the resolution of divided cultures, able in their unique and often visionary way to project and predict, predict futures that we are not yet able to see. In general, I try to distinguish between the future et l'avenir. Le futur, c'est ce qui, demain, tout à l'heure, le siècle prochain, deviendra ce qui est deviendra. Donc, il y a le futur des programmes, le futur prévisible, predictable, programs, prescriptions, tout ce qui, en quelque sorte, peut être schedule, pour, donc prévu. Et l'avenir, je préfère le mot avenir, to come, parce que ça se réfère à quelqu'un qui vient, à ce qui vient et qui, venant, arrivant, n'est pas prévisible. Et pour moi, c'est ça, le, le vrai futur, ce qui est imprédictable. L'autre qui vient sans que je puisse même l'attendre, d'une certaine manière, sans que je puisse m'y attendre. Donc s'il y a du vrai futur au-delà du futur, c'est l'avenir en tant qu'il est la venue de l'autre là où je ne veux pas le prévoir. Project Eight Falchrond by Counterspace. Shadow, noun. The effect of interception of sunlight, dark image cast by someone or something when interposed between an object and a source of light. As an ongoing supporting practice to our work, Counterspace pursues drawing of Johannesburg's edges and alternative architectures, curious of the rituals and dynamic negotiations of territory in the city. This is a ritual church ceremony on a mine dump. From the ground, buffers and walls are tangibly divisive devices between races, ethnicities, faiths and belief systems, economic brackets and ideologies. These images document how architecture, meaning and purpose is created with throwaway land, even if only fleetingly. Project, The Arab Summer by Frederick Kanamea, Unit 12. In a region with a highly curtailed public spray space, Frederick's project is a speculation for a new type of public space that exists entirely in the digital realm. Drawing on existing tactics of clandestine meeting and queer cultures in the region, the Arab summer speculates on an optimistic, celebratory, inclusive digital public, a public entitled to and allowed access into a world that they fought to bring into existence in the Arab Spring. The project is spectacle, making the invisible visible, and performative, 
It is digital as a website and real, situated in real sites in Morocco, in Morocco's economic center, Casablanca. In this project, an Arab sun rises over the square and a community of African, Arab, gendered, black indigenous people of color, queer and other bodies are there to greet it. Not by choice, but by necessity, much of my own way of working developed in the shadows. At school, I was interested in shadow practices as a survival mechanism, in the supernatural, in archives that could be found in the kitchen, in our recipes, songs, and stories, in how our belief systems, our DNA, and our landscapes are archives. I often look back at, to that time, just before I met Leslie, and wonder what would have happened with those ideas had they not found an audience in her. Our first encounter was actually in 2014 at the Witz School of Architecture summer show, where I saw Samaya's graduate work and immediately popped the question, would you like to teach with me? It took almost a year to find the funding to pay her and more memos than anyone, myself included, could ever have foreseen. There is a particular phenomena in South Africa, which I came to call the motivation moment, where no matter what you were asking for or whom your request was directed at, you would invariably be asked to write a motivation. I think this was the motivation that finally broke the camel's back. It's dated July 18th, 2015, almost 16 months later. And in typical Samaya fashion, we'd already started running unit three, which later became unit 12, eight months earlier without permission. We have both found that it is much easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. The teaching relationship between two, two, two tutors, sometimes more, is the absolute cornerstone of what we would both call transformational pedagogy. That is to say, an approach to architectural education that places issues of race, identity and difference at the core of teaching, not at the margins. In the US, it's often referred to as team teaching, which is accurate, but poorly understood. It isn't just a matter of getting two people to teach the same subject matter that one person can teach. It's a profound shift in the way we think about knowledge and the manner in which knowledge, particularly new knowledge, is produced. The role of leadership in the tutorial, which is the main teaching format, is crucial for two reasons. One, it produces a genuine dialogue between two people, sometimes more, which both engages and directs students. Two, it's the most effective method of producing new teachers. I learned almost everything I know about being a tutor from my tutor, Jonathan Hill, but I also became a better teacher through the combined encounters with these nine people who taught me in both direct and indirect ways how to teach. Ghost, noun. Most Indo-European words for this translate to soul or spirit, also with a double reference to supernatural, supernatural spirits. An appearance or an apparition, but other concepts also frequently translate to a returning. Project, material histories by counterspace. For the current Istanbul Biennial, our initial research into alternative archives in Morocco was used to create a two-part project. Part one included a series of folded architectures, collected on a shingle, a single sheet of paper, a recipe is unraveled to offer an exploded view, showing individual parts and their lesser known relations. These relations tell of multiple geographies, of trade routes, and the social and ecological consequences of resource extraction and forced movement. Folding the sheet physically draws connections between that which was assumed unconnected. Part two took the museum to public spaces, spaces that are overlooked but are the custodians of these quieter bodies of knowledge. These paper configurations became posters in public spaces where the elements exist. Marketplaces, restaurants, table surfaces, um, and sandwich wrapping, a recipe fixed to a shop window front would show how intertwined we all are, why we do what we do, who and what we hate and love and why. A note on the unconscious performance of histories. Project, Casablanca by Heidi Liu. In this project, through a series of performances, 
Heidi Liu dismantles a set of gendered domestic architectures in Morocco. This film describes the weight passage which slaves had to cross through to ensure that they were slender enough. History and the commodification of bodies read through architecture. The word test has a number of different meanings. A procedure intended to establish the quality, performance or reliability of something, especially before it is taken into widespread use. It's also an event or a situation that reveals the strength or quality of someone or something by putting them under strain. In metallurgy, it's a movable hearth in a furnace used to separate gold from silver or silver from lead. In our case, we've experienced it in multiple ways, from being put to the test, for example, in our accreditation visit of 2018, a three-day bare knuckle visit, which saw me sleeping on the floor of my office on the first night and bursting into tears in front of the whole school when the results were announced, to the resonance that we both find in the Zulu term for an architect, Mkambe Wesino, which means simultaneously a magician of space, a maker of a sensation, and a maker of a situation. And this is what we found, an inventory of feminist upheaval. Was anarchy merely an expression of love and care? The methods of struggle are improvised in the soul, improvised in the air, improvised from nothing. The reformers and the journalists didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know that the hallway and stairwell were places of assembly, or that you love in doorways. Feminists are activists. The riot is like a general strike a bridge between now and the free territory. The riot seeks to preserve nothing. Quaichu, Yangchu, Di Archi Si Yo Chen Mo. 
The enclosure provides the field for heroic deeds. Musadi utwarati ba kabohal. Lempi maelana na manto mazana mangani. Azo manenginga efana neyam. They dream a new set of arrangements. They dream the end of involuntary servitude. What did she think of herself? Not much or quite a lot? Depending how you looked at it. We are not what other people say we are. We are who we know ourselves to be. We are what we love. That's okay. What we stand on is not masonry. It is the torn place, unhealed. Yila is the land, Zingapoli Korn. Yila is the land, Zingapoli Korn. The late, great Toni Morrison has written and spoken many times on the need to remove herself from what she calls the white gaze in order to tell the story she needed to tell without either the burden of having to explain herself to an audience unfamiliar with her world or context, or the awkwardness of writing whilst addressing someone else, in her case, white America. My world is a black world. She was doing something that a lot of black writers who had come up in the 70s weren't doing, which was to write about the stories without having to talk about excising whiteness. And she didn't do it in a way that was about saying that the white world was wrong. The white world was just peripheral if it existed at all. I didn't want to speak for black people. I wanted to speak to and to be among. It's us. So. The first thing I had to do was to eliminate the white gaze. Jimmy Baldwin used to talk about that. The little white man that sits on your shoulder <laughs> and checks out everything you do and say. So then knock him off. And, you know, you're free. Now I own the world. I mean, I can write about anything to anyone, for anyone. I don't have to have this white judgmental eye checking me, editing me, approving of me. The decision to literally carve out the kind of space she required was both political and creative. This twinning or mirroring of politics and the imagination runs deep in both of us, from the briefs we set to the choice of reviewers. We're deeply invested and interested in the sense of play, wonder and beauty that emerges from the back and forth traffic between an individual and his or her work. Chimera, literally year old she goat from Kema winter season. Recompositions, reifications, transmogrifications from entirely different sources of DNA in one body. Project. Skins by Tonya Marie, Unit 12. Tonya Marie is a mixed race student whose ancestry is on two sides of the race spectrum, black and white. Tonya's project frames her own book of skins, which draws on 24 ritual and cultural practices related to the identity of nomadic tribes in the Sahara. She works with different skins, blurring body, clothing, and structure as a proxy for overlapping, clashing, and interweaving ethnicities, identities, politics, and geographies of various contested and opposed regions. She takes inspiration from these contradictions and complexities to develop new architectural skins, which express and counter the arbitrary nature of imposed boundaries in the form of festivals and rituals. These skins speculate on alternative political futures and a new set of relations between regions where relationships, borders, and territories allow for permeability and build on long-standing histories that can exist in a productive state of tension. Project, Pavilion 2020-2021 by Counterspace. This project, a four-month long wake, is a critical take on social sustainability 
and architectures and institutions of care. Places of community, of minority and of exclusion in London. The pavilion includes small movable parts that will be displaced to neighborhoods across London and following gatherings of these parts in the park, they will be returned to home sites across London. In this pavilion, an engagement with the displacement and replacement of peoples in place, we acknowledge sites of absence and sites of presence, mirrors of each other. It is a set of architectures entangled in the contemporary reconfigurations of belonging. Places of memory and care in Brixton, Hoxton, Hackney, Whitechapel, Edgware Road, Peckham, Ealing, North Kensington, and beyond are transferred onto the Serpentine Lawn. Where they intersect, they produce spaces to be together, spaces where perhaps you could meet someone. Over the past year, from the first signs of the emergence of COVID in February 2020 to the attack on the capital exactly a year later, more than ever, we find ourselves struggling to interpret events. The British filmmaker Adam Curtis in his most recent documentary, Can't Get You Out of My Head, reminds us that the way humans make sense of the world is not only through science or the choice of one political system over another, it is also through narrative. The world presents itself to us as data, events, information, images, experiences, in order to process and cope with the onslaught of information that we receive on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis. And we turn that data into stories, into narratives, tales that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Telling stories isn't a pastime, a choice, or even an occupation. It is fundamental to our survival as human beings. If the stories we tell ourselves cease to make sense, we cease to make sense. You sit in your room and you talk to the wall. You're feeling small, but still have a ball and you can't explain. Anyway, in rain, and you paint your face and dress in black and various shades, and still can't express the way you feel about a lousy feel, and you dance until the morning all by yourself. Tell me how you know You're not alone And you dance until the morning All by yourself And tell me how you know You're not alone The documentary concludes by telling us something that we already know, but seem to have forgotten. The ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something we make and could just as easily make differently. To do so, as I like to think Samaya and I have been trying to say collectively over the past six years, we need to, as Covey points out, succinctly and brilliantly live out of our imaginations not just our histories. The addition of the word just is ours. It has been the basis of everything we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. 
Thank you so much uh, to both of you for, for an incredibly inspirational presentation. And I know this is one of the great uh, challenges of our time is actually having conversations in some way in this uh, context. Um, but I'm going to, um, we're gonna have a, a few questions and a conversation. Uh, and I'm gonna pass this over to Nancy uh, Levinson to start us off. Uh, thanks, Isla. Thank you very much for this invitation to participate. And thanks to uh, Samaya and Leslie for that um, extraordinary presentation talk. Uh, I'm going to start us off with a question that is about moving from the sphere of good intentions to concrete actions. Uh, we know that the police murder of George Floyd last spring and the Black Lives Matter protests around the world have been followed by numerous calls to action within our disciplines, by demands to decolonize curricula, to unlearn whiteness, to diversify faculties and student bodies, to improve support systems for BIPOC students, and to confront the many forms of, of bias, both implicit and explicit, in our institutions. And to some degree, these efforts in academia are being mirrored in practice, though perhaps not to the same degree. So um, again, the big question, what actions today have seemed to you the most meaningful? What specific actions need to be taken to produce truly systemic change in architectural practice in education or to produce that true future that Jacques Derrida talked about or to make the world differently as David Graeber said? So a big question, but uh, it just seems really important because there has been so much stated and, and uh, that and so much stated that builds uh, on, on uh, actions to date. But I'm just curious as to what you two think have been most meaningful and, and what will be most important. Um, shall I start, Sydney? Yes, please. <laughs> Leslie, you might um, start in, in regard to your experience in Johannesburg in New York and with the African Futures Institute. Well, I mean, I think the first thing I would say is that, that you know, the decolonizing um, education conversation has been going on for a lot longer than a year. And, you know, I think that the US came to the party actually quite late. And, you know, my, my experience or my response to, to the question, I think, is, of course, going to be informed by the experience of, you know, having both started and led, but actually collectively worked to build a school, you know, for, for whom these questions were central. I think, as I said in the, in the talk, not marginal. And, you know, I have to say that if, if in the UK and in the US, there are um, actions that go beyond um, the statements, I, I haven't seen them yet. And what, what I do see is, you know, many, many institutions um, asking all the same question, which is what, you know, what should we do? And, you know, those, those same institutions, I think, want me and, you know, many, many people who've been working in this field for, for a really long time to, to sketch out some kind of roadmap or, you know, a series of, of pointers. But I, I don't have answers actually for, for institutions. Um, I'm enjoying at the moment, this very small glimpse that I'm getting of, you know, students who I think have the same hunger. But I, I have to be really honest and say that it simply reinforces the view that I had, you know, back in Johannesburg, you know, six, seven years ago, that actually what's what's required is, is rebuilding from the ground up. I, I think mm. you need a new kind of institution. Yeah. Um, if I can answer with something I've heard Leslie say a few times. Um, when the Fees Must Fall protests happened in South Africa um, at their height, I think in 2015, around the time when Leslie started the school, uh, students came to the institution and said, enough is enough, we want free decolonized education. And they, they basically brought the institution to its knees. And the institution said, okay, we'll give it to you. But nobody could say what it looks like. And I think... For me personally, what Leslie has done for both my um, teaching practice, but also tangentially my um, studio practice as well, is that she's created a space where it's about figuring out the roadmap, as, as, as Leslie put it now, without 
um, predetermining what that roadmap is beforehand, which I think in, embedded in a lot of the questions that we're hearing at the moment is a demand for concrete answers, but we, we don't have the answers yet because we're currently building them. So I think the most important thing and the most important takeaway that I've learned over these last years is the importance of creating space to carve out these questions so that we can build this roadmap. And I think that on the one hand, there are perhaps um, very pragmatic things that we can do, policy change and, and so on. But at the same time, we also need to nurture slower spaces of imagination because otherwise the short-term project just becomes a distraction as Toni Morrison and as Leslie has shown us. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's not a, you know, it's not an optimistic um, answer. And I know that that, you know, optimism is very much on, on the table. But I, I feel deeply that this is not a time for false optimism. This is a time for honesty. Um, and, you know, having these really difficult, painful, sometimes traumatic conversations, which everybody naturally wishes would end in some uplifting um, statement, I, I, I don't see it. So I have a follow-on question. Do you see the need for a, a repoliticization of architecture even more than what's happening now? Because a couple of things I noticed recently, um, there was a conversation in the New York Times last week with the Black Reconstruction Collective and Emmanuel Admasu said, similar, he said, it is not the responsibility of, of Black faculty to help the schools fix racism. He says, quote, part of what our collective wants to do is reclaim the larger civic promise of architecture. And that made me think of something, and, and this is something I read in, in your article, a um, minor majority, Leslie, you quoted the Cameroonian scholar, Ashio Madembe, who's, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name, but you quoted him as saying that true access in the university will not be about liberal notions of tolerance or inclusion or assimilation. And he writes or says, it has all to do with ownership of a space that is a public common good. It has to do with an expansive sense of citizenship and with the project of democracy, which means a deep commitment to some idea of publicness. Mm. No, I mean, you know, one of the things that um, confused me, I think when I first got to the, to the US was I would have these conversations you know, particularly at the, at the university around the term public. And it became very clear to me that what I understood by the word public was not what most of the people in the room, like in other words, we, we were coming to this word public with, with you know, differing, differing interpretations. And you know, I come from a tradition where all universities are public. You know, UK doesn't really have any private universities. So I didn't even come into the academic space cognizant of, of you know, the, the, the value um, sort of laden judgments on it. I mean, South Africa is the same. There are no private universities. And I, I, I began to understand very quickly, particularly in the US, that you know, the, the term public is, is quite a complex term. Public transport, public education, public health, you know, these things are not conceived of in the same way. So you know, coming in as a foreigner, speaking English, but, but you know, getting here and understand, or getting there and understanding that actually my English and their English were, were two different things. I think for me was part of a, a larger, I guess it, you'd call it a culture shock. And coming from a tradition which sees education as a fundamentally public right, it was very difficult to enter into these um, class um, constrained conversations around it, simply because I don't have the, I don't come with that, that cultural lens. And I, and I think um, this question of, what does the public mean in different contexts is really, really important. I mean, it's something that Samaya and I used to talk about all the time in Unit 12, you know, in, in the vast majority of African languages, there is a word for a stranger, there is a word for somebody who is a member of your clan, but there is no word for the public in the broader sort of civic sense of the word public. And yet in all the colonized languages, English, French, um, you know, Portuguese, we all speak about public as if we understand the same thing. And I think those nuances really matter. Um, and the, the kind of future I think that we all wish for really involves a radical rethinking of what public means. 
I think we can't take it for granted that we all understand it to mean the same thing. Maybe so, I, oh, sorry, good one, Isla. <laughs> Maybe I could follow up on that. Uh, you know, it's interesting, obviously, uh, UVA is a public institution or a public university, one of the first public universities. Uh, and yet um, the public component of that is of course the thing that has been eroded over time, you know? Uh, right now, we, we often refer to ourselves as the privately funded public university, uh, because literally in terms of state funding, you know, we receive 8% or something like that, you know, so, so it, and it's not uh, at all like the way that we um, understand notions of the public. And I, I want to come back to this, this idea of building from the ground up um, and this moment or the place of this moment within a, a longer history. Um, you know, because one of the questions is how, how hopeful we might all be in this moment or optimistic uh, about uh, producing real change and what, what are the things that hinder that change or stand in the way of that? Um, what does it take uh, to, to move things forward? You know, and we, uh, for many of us, the older ones perhaps in the room who have uh, lived through uh, from the 60s through to the present, uh, we, we know that those histories are some of the things that have come back to the table, you know, our, our shorter histories. Um, in the unlearning whiteness that was put forward by the faculty uh, at Columbia, they were recalling, you know, the civil rights era. And of course, uh, the work of Sharon Sutton and after that, um, after, you know, trying to forge institutional change, we then, you know, the 70s was followed by the Bush-Reagan era. We saw backlash. Uh, we saw the resurrection of canonical histories in another way. Um, and then that oscillation continued uh, in the 30 years to follow. You wrote, um, you know, you noted uh, that when White Paper's Black Marks uh, was published in 2000, six years after its inception, and it was one of the few anthologies about uh, dedicated to race as a meaningful category of inquiry. Um, you believe that issues around race, identity, gender, culture, and migration would take center stage again. And we could say, you know, that was another wave. And then, you know, that was the mid 1990s, 25 years ago. Um, and there was much more critical inquiry then than there is now. Um, and it is coming back. So. You know, having lived through this and seen how this has unfolded, and of course, uh, this is different because I'm I'm also referring to a very American or North American uh, context in this. But what do you, based on your experiences, what kind of organizational structures uh, or atmospheres and narratives, ideological systems, uh, what are what are the things that are working against change? And what are the things that you think are necessary to, to really transform? Uh, and we, you know, from within this, we can talk about this from the perspective of academic uh, institutions, architectural institutions, for example. Um, you know, when, when, when we started the GSA, um, which, to date, I think has been the only place I have worked at which, which took seriously, and, and, and I mean that in a really, um, in a really meaningful way. It, it really took seriously the idea of transformation. And it was partly prompted by the context, but also prompted, as Samaya said, by, by student protests, which, which effectively just shut the universities down. So, you know, there was, no, there was nowhere else for people to go. They, they had to go forward. And one of the first things that, um, about that situation that was so empowering was that actually we could do anything. So I was the only full-time mm -hmm. staff member for five years, which, you know, in, in a school of a hundred postgraduate students is absolute madness. So at a kind of administrative level, it was, it was a crazy project, but I didn't have tenured faculty. I didn't have committees. If I needed money, I went out and I found money. I, I fundraised. I, I didn't really, when I say I, I'm actually talking about the broader institution. 
we didn't have to answer to, to anyone. And it's risky, you know, to, to set up a school with, with so little um, oversight and so little regulation, I think is, is a really risky prospect. And one of the first things I was told when I, when I got to the US was that, you know, this is a very, very regulated society. Don't think you can come and, and, and do that here. And so the, the absence of regulation in some senses was, was, was really key. But for all its lack of regulation, it produced, I think, over you know, four, five, six years, genuinely explorative work. And I, and I refer back to, to Simi's statement, which was that space had to be made for us to construct the roadmap. And you know, it's, it's partially been constructed, in, in, in a very different context. I think the real issue now is whether the global north, the UK, Europe, the United States can find the appetite to, to give an institution or a number of institutions that same amount of freedom. Mm. If, if um, I mean, one of the things that is interesting in a way is that you're starting new, but you were still dependent, right? Or I should say, uh, you were linked up to a larger institution, um, you know, so um, which which we could say uh, gives you the best of both worlds, you know, uh, starting a kind of core, a new program, uh, etc. But, um, you, know, you know, in a way, you've already answered this question, but it's the, it's the question of do you do you think change these kinds of changes can be institutionalized because this is it's part of the larger question. I was very taken in your presentation uh, about the, the notion that design is about the unpredictable future. I'm often saying that as, you know, as designers, we are world makers and that is what we do. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, what we make reifies, you know, into institutions, into histories. Um, so how do we how do we ensure that those changes that might have that incredible lifeblood that is part of what you're talking about in the making uh, of the new program in Johannesburg, how does that how does that get institutionalized or can it or should it? Uh, what, what are your thoughts around that? You know, or is it about making new schools? I mean, you know, uh, and new kinds of programs. I mean, I think there's, there's a hunger at the moment for, for product, um, you know, for, for work that's, that in some way explores and explains, you know, what, this big, what, what these big questions mean. You know, at, at the moment, I, I find a lot of what, what I talk about is collapsed into the, into the term social justice. And social justice is one part of it. Actually, I think it's a much broader um, um, set of interests. And I think, um, you know, after some time and, you know, maybe it's five years, maybe it's 10 years, work emerges that's, um, that's more robust, that's more formed. I mean, for me, that's the beginning of the formation of new canon. And once that's released into the world, and I think that's partly what schools like the GSA have done, you know, that, that there's work now circulating out there that students can refer to, tutors can refer to, it's there. Once that starts to take place, then I think it's much more, um, the, the question of institutionalizing becomes much more viable because actually what you required was this kind of unregulated exploratory space in order to make the work. Then the work emerges and then it you know, gets appropriated, it gets taken on, it gets changed, transformed, et cetera. And at that point, I think it is ripe for institutionalization. I, I don't know yet that there is enough work you know, the, the GSA is a very, very small school located in the tip of Africa. You know, it's one school amongst many. At, at the moment, it's the only school that I know of that has really taken this question into its center. One hopes that there will be more schools that will do, do something similar. I mean, I was on a really long call with, with another unnamed school, you know, four and a half hours of you know, unpaid time, you know, talking to, to, to the school about what they should do. And I said, listen, the simplest thing to do is to, is to set up a, a unit on, on race and architecture. Absolute silence. Nobody ever came back to me. It seemed to me to be the most obvious thing to do. You're interested in explorative work. You're interested in, in making space. Make this small space, 20 students. I mean, what would it cost you? Nada. But do you think, I mean, one of the big questions uh, always is the issue of um, 
something existing on the periphery, you know, of the institution itself, you know, which might be true to its center. You know, I, I hear Morrison in the back of my mind here, you know, and at the same time, uh, the question of making these things pervasive, you know, within, you know, the core curriculum, et cetera. And, and as soon as it becomes a thing unto itself, that, that becomes part of the challenge, right? Is that it doesn't, it doesn't transform the canon from within. Uh, it's operating in another space potentially. I mean, I, I think, I think maybe if I can think of my experience of, of, of practice and teaching here, um, it's maybe not so much, I think the, the, the challenge is when something becomes institutionalized and its institutional structures look exactly as the, the same as the other institutional structures. And what, what Leslie's saying about the work and about the way that the school functioned, it's not that there was no structure, um, you know, what Leslie said about tenure and so on is true. I, I think it's just that the structure that we functioned in and that we started to develop was a completely different structure to the one that the university had um, imposed and set up already. And I also think that the failure comes in when these models have to, um, the, 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 it's almost like legislation and bureaucracy can't hold the value of what is actually being produced. And that's when it falls flat because then it has to curtail itself and fit into you know, little things and try and tie itself up and so on. Um, similar to what Leslie said about public, I think it's, it's the same. Once, once um, structures have to conform to certain laws and norms that have been set up in a particular way, they die because those can't hold them. And, and that's, it's the fault of um, institutional structures. I know that sounds obvious, but I think that what Leslie has set up with the school um, shows us that entirely new institutional models can almost happen. Um, and if we push them further, we, you know, there's something waiting there that, that we haven't seen before. So speaking and that of, is a hybrid. Speaking of pushing them further and just moving, you know, from this, the idea that we need a large transformation to thinking about first steps, which always seems so puny when you're talking about transformation. Um, thinking about the highly regulated realm of US and European academia, um, would we need something, let's say like a tenure moratorium? Would something as, as disruptive as that, like a period of time where you suspend the usual rules and you give yourself the freedom to experiment, would something like that be the kind of specific action that you... Yeah. You know, I, I studied myself um, in, in London in the 90s, um, actually a, a quite an unstable period. I mean, you know, tenure... The tenure construct in, in Europe is actually, or certainly in the UK, is quite different. So people, you know, don't go in thinking about tenure. So for me, it was quite a, quite a foreign construct in a way. But, you know, the Bartlett in, in the 1990s was, was quite an unstable place. And, and that instability actually allowed a, a great flourishing of, of very imaginative and, and also, you need to be fair, quite exploitative practices. So, you know, the, the relationship between exploration and exploitation, you know, as I'm discovering now is also quite a, quite a thin line. But it was interesting to me that, you know, when we set up a new model in, in Johannesburg, we didn't invent it from scratch. I mean, I actually just took the model from the AA in the 1970s and kind of replicated it. So it's, it's not as if, you know, this was a, a huge leap of the imagination, but it was interesting to me that a model from the 1970s could be transplanted 6,000 miles away and followed almost to the letter, it allowed or gave a kind of creative space in much the same way it did in, in Europe in the 1970s. So I think that these models of experimental schools have been around for a very long time. And, you know, I'm always struck by the particular nature of South Africa, which is very different from the US and Europe where, where blacks are in the majority so you're talking about a majority population and a majority culture finding its, its voice, which I think is very different 
in, in, in Europe and the US. But it, for me, and I, th I think some of you would say the same thing, the most exciting and exhilarating moments of the GSA were those moments where students, black students, produced work that could only have come out of their own experiences and their own history. Mm -hmm. But then that work became appropriated and available for all. Mm -hmm. So that, that moment where suddenly the, 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 the playing field was leveled was the, for me the beginning of new canon. So it wasn't, you know, that there is one canon for black students, there is one canon for Indian students, there's one canon for white students, absolutely not. It was, it was about a, a kind of leveling of, of what everybody can bring to the table. And that required, you know, I've said this so many times, the, 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 the faculty, the teaching staff were really young, you know, some barely a year, two years out of, of grad, after graduation. And that naivety on the one hand, but also an incredible courage on the other produced some outstanding, outstanding work, risky, but, but outstanding. So thinking about this question of new canon, um, both of you have written in the letters to a young architect series in the Architectural Review. And um, Samaya, your letter, which was to your younger self, had a, a refrain, there is another canon here. And you were um, evoking various sites and places and sensual phenomena in Johannesburg. You were thinking about your mistrust of the historical record and the silences and absences. So I have a, a question about what, what this other canon might consist of. And I just wanna frame it with two distinct trajectories. Mm -hmm. uh, recently on Twitter, Jess Varner wrote, confession, last semester as a new professor at MIT, I set a goal. I taught the history of modern architecture, 20th century, and never once mentioned the name Le Corbusier. On the other hand, in his, in his uh, memoir, Between the World and Me, Ta-Nehisi Coates recalled a racist put down from the author Saul Bellow. Who is the Tolstoy of the Zulus? To which Coates's answer, quoting the black writer, Ralph Wiley is, Tolstoy is the Tolstoy of the Zulus unless you find profit in fencing off universal properties of humankind into exclusive tribal ownership. In other words, do the existing canons need to be dismantled or can they be reappropriated and redefined to the point where decolonization is understood not only as a process of, of including what has been left out, but of radically redefining what is already there, of making mm -hmm. it unwhite. Hmm. I mean, I think that this um, invoking of there's another canon here is, is simply trying to recognize that it's not that this information doesn't exist or that, the, that bodies of knowledge and archives are not there. They are there. It's just that, again, institutional systems and um, Formal, formal bureaucracies, formal archiving systems, and so on, can't hold those ways of being because they are oral, they are oral, they are embodied, they are performed, they are ritual, they may exist in, you know, recipes, song stories, some of the things I mentioned in the letter also, um, or they exist, you know, on, on sites and in places and they can't easily be transcribed in, in, the, in the systems that we have as we know them. And that's because no, I think, you know, of course, historically, um, the exclusions that we faced have meant that nobody wanted to include them and um, the way that things have been documented and so on ensured that they were erased and left out. And I think that what those invocations um, is trying to say is that we have been trained to see a certain way and we've been trained to be blind to so much that is around them. Um, recently, I think it was for International Women's Day, Tazine asked for um, underrepresented architects. And I just had to look at a few photographs of sites in South Africa, of women building homes and so on. And I'm, I'm not advocating for a particular architectural style by any means, but I do think that 
within the, within all the cultures and traditions around them the, around us sorry there is so much that is waiting to happen that's waiting to be evolved and it is um the fault of the system that they haven't been recognized as such and and i, I again i think that trying to squeeze them into our existing structures is is um, going to erase them or translate them poorly yeah, I mean, I would, you know, to add to that, I would say that, and I've said it again so many times, decolonization is a gift, it's not a gun. It is an absolute mm -hmm. gift to the canon. Um, and what, what I'm very proud of, actually, you know, in, 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 you know, most of the work that's come out over the past, you know, five, six years, is, is its, its generosity. You know, um, getting students, moving students from, from a place of extreme anger to a, a place of productivity is, is hard work. Mm. Um, and, and somehow the, the, the space, the school, the studio, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, that job of turning anger in, mm. into creative expression is, it's, it's tough. But, but it's also absolutely necessary. Maybe, maybe I can um, shift this a bit uh, to medium and media because I, I, I'm very taken uh, by your presentation and of course the, the form that it's in, you know, we, and, and so my referred to um, the kinds of language, the difference obviously between oral histories and canonical histories, et cetera. But I'm also interested in the medium uh, or the media that you're both using, uh, everything from fiction writing, theory, uh, to film, documentaries, poetry, uh, all kinds of visual um, media. And of course, I'm always thinking about the relationship of these to our disciplines, right? You know, and in some ways, the, the challenge, let's say, around uh, the issues of institutionalization, the challenges around notions of the canon, also come back to the thing, the structures that are part of our disciplines, right? Mm -hmm. that, that have stopped, uh, that have stopped um, groups from gaining access easily, right, uh, into the professions. Um, but I'm also interested in the ways in which the performance, the language, the aestheticization of struggle in another way gets brought into architecture. And you've been using these different media. How do you, how do you see that transformation taking place? Does it matter to you if it becomes architectural? or not, um, you know, because it's, it's about a larger dialogue. Um, what, what is the role of medium and, and uh, in relation to this work in particular? I think it will become architectural. Um, and I think that I've seen in my in my own practice, and I'm not saying that by any means I'm getting anything right, but I've certainly seen that so many of the ideas that we've worked with drawing in um, the teaching studio have filtered down in, into how the practice works. And in this interest, for example, in choreography or in working with the sonic. Um, and I think that the, the, I, the translation is not, it's not always one-to-one -one in terms of how things translate to architecture, but I think it's certainly there. Um, and I also think that in a way, it's really important that we start to also include, um, I don't know, I certainly feel that for counter space, it's important that we start to include um, things that are considered non-architectural also within the architectural realm. So we also work, for example, on um, films, on performances, on, you know, we work often with projections, with things that are ephemeral and, and so on. And I see them as, as valid as making both um, outputs. And that is because I think that at the moment, those are tools to draw out and to reckon with and to um, 
even absorb and understand uh, ways of being that don't easily translate into something that is very static at the moment. And I think, of course, this is still young and still ongoing, um, but I can also feel and see in, in our student work and, and certainly in my peers' work as well, that something is starting to shift and we're, we're asking architecture to be more than just, than just. <laughs> um, I think also on representation, it is absolutely important that we draw in as many different ways as possible and that we also start to include and expand our drawing languages to, as you said, um, you know, include sound, include um, many different other forms and ways of drawing, because I think that, um, I'm repeating myself, but those are also ways of, of synthesizing. Drawing is a way of synthesizing. And at the, the many of the traditional tools that we have, it's, it's again like an institutional system, which you said, to, can't hold um, so much. And maybe some of these other forms of drawing try. Yeah, and I mean, um, you know, for me, everything begins and ends in the imagination. If you can't articulate it, you can't think it. And drawing, and, and I use, I mean, my poor students in, in UVA at the moment, I think are completely confused by what I mean when I say the word drawing. But, but drawing is such an, an expansive term. And often when you are trying to put something into words that has no precedent, being able to sing, being able to dance, to, to use the body, to, to project. I see those as tools that, that literally take the idea out of the imagination and bring it into the world. And for me, that is architectural, it's spatial. I, I, I think, I guess I've always seen architecture as a wider category than the building of buildings. And I don't know that it will not eventually go through these multiple translations you know each time you edit out a little bit more you you come to what's important you go to the heart of it those sorts of iterations do produce um new new ways of thinking about about architecture and that i guess is what keeps me certainly interested in this discipline you know i i'd studied other things before i came to architecture i remember at my interview at the bar that you know i think stephen groak said to me you know why do you want to study architecture and i said well i'm really tired of knowing a little about a lot of things. I want to know one thing in depth. And he said, well, you know, come back in five years time and tell me if, if that's what you found. And actually after five years, I found that I knew less than when I'd come in. And, and that's the, in a sense, that's the alchemy of architecture. It presents itself as something incredibly solid and grounded and stable, and it's anything but, which is why I also think it's the most appropriate discipline for these kinds of really tough questions that cut across all kinds of issues. You know, it's, it's not only formal, it's not only spatial, it's political, it's social, it's cultural, it's linguistic, it's, you know, on and on and on. But as a, as a discipline, I think it can, hold the, it can hold that. As a practice, I think it holds it very poorly. I, I absolutely agree with you uh, both. I think, you know, this is, a. It's an interesting one for me because uh, the question around um, media and the expansiveness around media is also, you know, when we talk about the expansiveness around culture, around ethnicity, around race, gender, uh, and the same, you know, if when I was talking about the the kind of history, let's say, of the past fifty years or fifty plus years, uh, it's interesting because watching how architecture. Uh, where its lines get drawn around architecture in relation to media and in relation to and often parallel the lines that get drawn in relation to its canon. You know, I started architecture in the, in the late 70s and, you know, so it was the end of an era where, you know, people were doing happenings, building dome homes in the desert and there wasn't one project that was actually sited on land. You know, it was either underwater research stations or things that floated in the sky. All the media were um, uh, were arranged, and then you know, two years later, it was museum board. You know, uh, with with a certain kind of size of pencil. And I think that, and the histories also sort of transform. And I see that. You know, I've seen that happen sort of multiple uh, times. So I think this question of medium is important. But in the same way that we ask the question of 
institution, how these things become institutionalized as opposed to becoming external practices that feed into, uh, it's always interesting to me about how it gets transcoded or how, you know, how it transforms over time or how it leads to, let's say, the transformation uh, of the canon. And, and, and maybe the, the last question I have has to do with the same condition, except in relation to geography, sort of cross-cultural differences. Um, you know, place is so significant for us in relation to histories, events, the evolution of narratives. And you, you know, both have been talking about the difference between sort of operating in the US versus the UK, uh, Europe and Africa. Um, our, our histories can also be a hindrance to gaining perspective, you know, from a point of view external to the narrative, um, which is necessary both for critique, but also for this invention, you know, uh, future oriented uh, practices. I'm, I'm interested in, you know, your perspective, especially from um, operating in South Africa, operating uh, in, in Ghana and the UK, what advice you would give uh, US-based architects and, and academics, um, uh, what we can learn from you, you know, uh, in relation to, to some of the issues that we're trying to take on currently. You, you transported, Leslie, you talked about taking, um, taking something from the Bartlett in terms of the kind of structure or, or that and the AA uh, to Johannesburg. It's a very different structure than the way that we operate here. Um, what do you think, uh, what kind of perspective can you give us around those kinds of migrations? Because the migration of practices and thinking uh, becomes like the migration of bodies that we're also dealing with. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really good question and it's, and it's a bit of a conundrum. I mean, in the presentation, I think we talked about, you know, the US being one of the places that has the most influx of, of you know, newness. It's, it's constantly kind of regenerating. But at the same time, I also found it one of the most inflexible um, contexts in, in terms of dealing meaningfully with difference. So there's, you know, there's a strange model of I guess you'd call it assimilation, um, which, which for me has always been a conundrum, that, that it's, a, it's a place that's made up of, of incredibly rich, fragmented histories, narratives, and yet its overriding principle is, is of um, subsuming them. Um, so, so for me, that's, I guess it's maybe a slightly broader question. But I think that um, the one thing that distance does give you um, it gives you two things. One is a, a sense of insecurity, which I think can be a productive sense of insecurity in that you're never fully at home anywhere. So you're more watchful, you are more um, alert, I think. You, you, you have to work a little harder to, to read what is often not being said. And I think any immigrant will tell you that that's, you know, that's one of the conditions of, of, of migration. But having worked in, in a number of different areas, I would say that the perspective of how these issues are, are, are played out in different places has only ever been a productive one for me. Um, and it's allowed maybe a more complex reading of, of race and identity than, than I might have had if I'd, if I'd only ever been in one location. And you know, the other day I was reading something, I think it was in The Economist about the McKinsey um, um, consulting firm and how the internal culture has become so dominant that, that somehow the firm can't see itself. And you know, in many conversations I've had, not, not just in the US, but you know, also in the UK, I, I, I have this sense of, of places that cannot see themselves any longer because the, the, the view is only an internal one. And you know, the post-colonial world is always looking elsewhere. You know, it's, it's always in reference to, to somewhere else. And so that sense of double vision of looking at yourself, but also looking, looking at others looking at you can also produce a kind, it can produce a kind of paralysis on the one hand, but it can also produce a kind of, um, like a flowering, a, a blossoming of, of work, which I think is what we saw um, in, in our students. 
it's, it, it, I think it's a, a fantastic um, way of thinking about it. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, Canadian and I used to always talk about the difference between multiculturalism versus the melting pot. Um, yeah. You know, the and uh, celebrating, let's say, the notion of multiculturalism uh, versus the, the idea of the melting pot that you give up your identity to become American. Uh, and it's, um, and you both are operating in worlds where you're going back and forth between continents, have, you know, in, intersectional identities in this. Um, and I think that's a, um, one of the most affirmative ways of thinking uh, that helps you think uh, about the, the questions that you're taking on. Um, do you think uh, intersectionality or the, the way in which we're thinking not across a single issue like race, but race, gender, class, sexuality, um, you know, how we advance mutual interests without, be without it becoming tribalisms, you know? Um, because I think that's also one of the challenges of some of the issues that we're that we're taking on these days. Yeah, I mean, you 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 had that great quote. I think it was Nancy. You know, um, you know, Tolstoy is the Tolstoy of the Zulus. You know, as as well as you know of the Russians. And I think, you know, for me, it goes a little bit back to to the question you were asking about representation, which is to say that when when you're asking students to do something that has no firm precedent, you cannot expect them to explore and explain at the same time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult to, it's difficult to work when you're conscious of yourself working. It's a bit like, I think Beatrice Colomina says that, you know, if you, if, you, if you think about how to ride a bicycle, you'll fall off. And allowing st students, particularly black minority students who are seeking to turn an emotive response to the world into something physical, you know, whether it's a drawing, a model, you know, in, in, into work. If you burden them too much with the task of explaining what they're doing, it, it will dry up. And so and this is a very roundabout way of trying to say that that act of coming and going, of being here and there, of, of moving position is also a way of teaching. You have to know when to let the exploration continue and when to, to, to rein it in. And so there's something about, I think, both of our spatial uh, experiences that has been really useful in teaching. I, I think that's how I would answer that. Yeah. Well, I think we are uh, nearing the the end of our uh, event this evening, but I, I want to thank the three of you uh, and thank Leslie and Samaya for, for teaching with us uh, and investing in a longer way uh, with UVA uh, and, and for inspiring us um, uh, this evening as well. And thank you, Nancy, uh, and Places for... Um, thank you, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's been great. Thank you so much.